Hello and welcome back to FinCree. Free education. Well, how free is it really? If you're not living under the rock, then you would probably know that US government recently decided to forgive some student loans. Anyone with a student loan of under $10,000 and earning less than $125,000 would be eligible for forgiveness. Or if you receive the Pell Grant and earn less than $125,000, then you may receive up to $20,000 in loan forgiveness. So let's discuss the good and the bad aspects of it today. You see, a country is as good as its people. If the people are living a prosperous life, then it is good. And if not, then, well, you get the idea. Now, America has been dealing with this problem of trillions of dollars of student loans. As per the latest numbers, about 43 million Americans have an outstanding student loan, with the total amounting to over $1.7 trillion. That's about 8% of the total GDP. With so many people under these huge debts, obviously it is not something that would be celebrated, especially in the world's largest economy. But it is still there. And I will be honest, I am a little torn on this issue. Based on the estimates, the US government plans to spend about $300 billion for the immediate relief to millions of students. And it may bring relief to thousands of families. Which is certainly something to cherish, but while that seems good, how good is it economically or even morally? To understand this, we first need to understand the mechanism of US higher education loans. It starts with the Higher Education Act of 1965. When you seek a loan from a bank, they would generally ask you to put a collateral. For example, if you took an auto loan, then your car is the collateral. Or in a mortgage, your house becomes the collateral. If you fail to pay back the loan to the bank, then the bank can take possession of those collaterals. For a student loan, there is no such recourse for the lender, which is why such loans are risky for the bank. As per the Higher Education Act of 1965, the government would provide grants to the universities, which could further be passed to the deserving students. Also, a student could get a federally insured loan for education. So essentially, it is the government co-signing a loan for you. Therefore, if you fail to pay back the loan, the government assumes the responsibility. The law obviously had various amendments over the years. So, the government is taking care of its citizens, right? Well, not so fast. If we were to take a look at the cost of education, the rise is nothing short of dramatic. For public universities, the average annual cost of four-year college was around $738 in 1980, which, if we were to adjust for inflation, would be around $2,444 in today's value. But today's average annual cost of a four-year college is around $9,349, which is almost four times the cost in 1980, even after adjusting for inflation. Similarly, for private universities, the average annual cost for a four-year college was around $3,225, which would equal to $10,686 after adjusting for inflation. But the average cost today is around $32,769, Again, more than three times the cost in 1980 after adjusting for inflation. So the question is, what is it that happened that led to such a rise in the cost of education? And more importantly, does it deserve to be that expensive? When you take a loan from the bank, the simple criteria for approval is the potential of the borrower to pay back. And for a student, that can be gauged by the earning potential after graduation. If we look at the default percentages as per the field in which the students majored, we can see the default rate is the highest for students who majored in arts and humanities at over 26% for non-selective colleges. Selective colleges are ones which are ranked competitive by Barron's Profile of American Colleges. In the same stat, you can see that STEM fields have the lowest default rate. And this is not to take a dig on any specific field, but just to specify how much the earning potential after the completion of a degree matters in terms of how easy or difficult it is going to be to pay off the debt. You can see the majors with the largest percentage share in the total student loan borrowers. Associate degrees in liberal arts feature among the top five. Also, if we look at the potential earning to debt ratio, you can see most STEM courses featuring at the top. This simply means that if you were to take a student loan for a degree in the STEM field, then it may be far easier for you to pay off the loan. Whereas, if the degree is in a course like education, then it may become much harder. For example, for degrees like law and pharmacy, even though the potential to earn is very high, the earning at the start of the career may not be as high. 
and because these are degrees where you may require further higher education, the debt amount is likely to be higher, which is why these professions rank low in the earnings to debt ratio. So after looking at these stats, we can clearly see that some of those degrees are not worth the amount that is asked and paid for. Therefore, to answer our earlier question whether college deserves to be this expensive, we can clearly say no. But then the question is, if we know the potential return on investment, then why is it that these degrees are so expensive? Well, the problem starts with the Higher Education Act of 1965. If you saw my previous videos, you would know that I'm a proponent of free market. Because when the government generally steps in, they decrease the risk for a certain party and increase the same risk for the other. And the same happened in this case. For the lenders who lend money, the risk is decreased significantly because even if the student defaults, the government will step in. Or if the government itself lends, which is the case with majority of those loans, well then there is no issue at all. So the bank can approve the loan regardless of the amount asked for and the potential of the student to pay back, as they are sure to get the money back. And as discussed in the previous videos, where does the government get money to fund these policies? The taxpayers. That is the party that gets their risk increased. And because the universities know that students won't have any problem in getting the financial aid from the taxpayers, they can increase the fee as much as they want. This is the reason why cost of education has outpaced inflation so much. Now imagine if this was a free market, the lenders would have to seriously vet the students that they are lending to, so there would be lesser loans granted and most of those would have been for the students who may go to STEM fields. Colleges would have to make sure that the fee is in line with the return on investment, as there would be lesser number of students in the fields where it is hard to get a student loan. Also, with the courses which have a high demand, would also achieve economies of scale, which should bring down the total fee. Now, the question is whether spending this $300 billion would help the students, and is it a good solution to the problem? $300 billion is minuscule when you take the overall spending of the country into account. And sure, it will definitely help the students who are dealing with this problem in the short run. But it doesn't solve the problem, because the colleges will still increase the fee as they want. New students will come in and seek bigger loans, and the government and lenders will keep approving and increase the total debt further. Then the government will have to spend more to help those students, and this cycle would keep going. And the only thing that the government has to do to fund these policies is to increase the taxes. That's it for today guys. Hope you enjoyed the video. All the references are available in the description as always. Please do like, share and subscribe to the channel. See you next time.